I'm Nikki Javikik from Look Up Strata. Today we're speaking with Alex McCormack, Branch Manager from BCS Melbourne, and Nathan Clark, Licensed Strata Manager and Branch Manager from Hunter Strata, after we noticed a series of posts on LinkedIn from both Alex and Nathan concerning low strata management fees and their impact on the strata industry across Australia. I'm Nathan. I've uh, been in strata for now for about 18 years. I uh, started my life at Picker, actually, um, at BCS in Newcastle. I've worked through now. I'm a, so you call operations manager at uh, Hunter Strata now, managing the two offices of Honeysuckle and Maitland. Had a bit of a e experience with tendering and trying to get that sort of work, seeing the price movements or non-movements there, so to speak, uh, and, and what the oppositions are, are up to. So it's a, it's a very tough space at the moment. I'm Alex. I've been in Strata for about, I think, 11 years now. Um, I came into it out of my law degree and I just knew I didn't want to be a lawyer. I started working for a boutique company, um, looking after plans in two states and probably being one of the early, earliest operators um, in sort of a working from home uh, as an employee, not as an, not as an owner operator, but as an employee of somebody. Um, so I had Queensland and Victoria plans. My um, partner and I decided we wanted to move back to Melbourne, where I'm originally from and where she'd spent her time in Australia from originally. So that was moving back from Brisbane uh, to Melbourne and worked with a couple of businesses down here um, of different different types. And now the um, Melbourne uh, slash Victoria branch manager for, for BCS. Can we talk about sustainable management? What are the implications for the strata industry? Quarry benchmarking report. Puts them. Roughly a third of strata managers change employer a year at the moment. And yeah, at the moment, it's previously, it's been a lower percentage, but it was still in the vicinity of 20%. And when we talk sustainability, we're not just talking pricing. We're not just talking dollars. We're talking people as well. People always factor into the sustainability conversation. And I think we need to look very sincerely and genuinely about why that's happening. One third of your customer facing staff effectively choosing to leave an organization and try another one each year is not a glowing statistic for what we do and i think just about everybody i've worked with in strata is really proud of what we do and we need to have a look at why that is and i think when you boil it down there's just about a company for every every kind of culture you're seeking you know there's large and corporate there's there's small boutique bespoke there's sort of companies in the middle uh, both in terms of size and how they see themselves, you know, family values, more modern, they've been been, here, been with uh, the industry for a long time, going back 30 years, maybe longer, 40 years, depending on where they are. And so I don't think it's that we lack the right cultures. I think most of the employers in the industry are actually really good for the, for the most part. Um, and probably what it comes back down to is workload. If, we, if we're going to be a, an industry that's sustainable, uh, and values its people we've got to have manageable workloads and how do we get there and you know obviously i um, have fairly public opinion about this but i think we need to do much better with the revenue point the price point in our industry because ultimately it's a pretty simple business model in terms of how do we pay for our staff we've got to manage a certain certain amount of money coming in and that that money coming in at the moment is too low. And so when staff are either overworked, having to manage an unrealistic volume of, of clients or activity within their clients in order to justify the salary position, the salaried position and the support around them. So that's sort of, that's how I see things. Yeah, yeah. well, I agree. Pretty much every point you've just made there. Uh, the other aspect too, I think that strata managers need to do better on is um, yeah, communication out to our clients on what our actual role is. I think there's a lot of misconceptions on what we do, how we're paid, how we're remunerated. Um, and I think that's a lot of frustration out there in the marketplace. Um, and, and the expectations, it's setting expectation limits, which again, helps with the mental health of our staff members and, and team members as well. I think that's a massive issue and, and a big uh, area where burnout starts occurring when you start getting those unrealistic expectations and clients where we haven't either set the expectation ourselves properly or their expectations way out of whack. I know as a, as a Strata manager is now retired, that you got the expectations too high, she's just going to let you go. Uh, <laughs> and we had a lot of um, customers come to us going, oh, well, she, she told us to leave, blah, blah, blah. And, and her, her response when they said, oh, well, why are you letting this go? He goes, well, it's not, you just don't select us, we select you. And I think as a marketplace uh, as strata managers, that's, that's where we need to get to as well. If um, people are unrealistic, the expectations are out of whack, we've got to let them go. And 
and be open about it and let other managers know. Like, I think in the tendering process, there's a lot of we're trying to be all closed and, and secretive about it all, where, you know, every, everywhere else we seek references. Why can't we do the same in the strata management space? So we're obtaining references for the building and the committee that you're working with? Yes, yeah, to a point, because, you know, someone comes to you, you hey, why did the other team, uh, you know, the other company let you go? What's the issues with that company that you're seeing that, hey, can we do better on that? So there's some questions that don't get asked a lot. Uh, or we sit there and go, we'll try and beat you at the bottom dollar, which is really a race to the bottom, which is where we don't want to be. But there's things that you also got to take into account of, you know, what's their committees like? What's their interactions with the strata manager like? And, you know, people leave and go, we don't get on with the strata manager. Okay, there is always a conflict or there can be a conflict between people. But a lot of the time it's they're being unrealistic. They've been told no too many times. They're going, yeah, they're going elsewhere and then you'll still have the same problems. Okay, that leads really well into the next question that I had. So thank you for that, Nathan. <laughs> um, when owners are tendering for strata managers, what do you think they should be thinking about? Do owners consider value or are they too focused on price per lot? And in that instance, what is the committee's responsibility? They do focus a lot on that bottom dollar. So what they really should be thinking of, what sort of service do they want? What do they want out of their relationship with their strata manager? You know, your, your dollars, obviously, while it's important at some point, it's it shouldn't be your primary, secondary, or even third focus. You know, what's your relationship like on with the strata manager? What services do they offer? What you know, do you need apps? Do you need what communication aspects are you going to have with them? What knowledge do they have that they are going to assist you in your building? Uh, that's where your focus needs to be. Dollar dollar wise, if you have two the tick all the boxes, then look at dollars. But then there's too many people looking at dollars first rather than last. I couldn't agree more. If you look at everything that's classified as strata right now, a $1.3 trillion class. And individually, your average apartment in the country is somewhere between about $640,000, $650,000 in value. Um, and those are people's homes. So very much to Nathan's point, I think we have to reframe the question about what, what do you want as an outcome for your home? Let's take away what what the pathway to get there is for the moment we can work backwards to that what do you want as the outcome to be uh, you know if if the outcome is you want it to keep incrementing in value along whatever the you know the trend line for that for apartment for townhouse for luxury apartment you know in your suburb in your you know for the size all of that if you want it to keep incrementing as it should and you want it to still be a viable well maintained place to live in 5 years 10 years, 15 years, maybe it's maybe it's an investment. Maybe it's going to be where your kids go and stay when they're off to uni one day and they, you know, they fly out of the nest and all of that. Whatever the, the, the answer to that question is, what do you want the outcome to be? And then let's work, let's work backwards from there. We can't guarantee, obviously, what the value is going to be, but we can show you how we're going to maintain the property generally. Lifts, facade, water leaking, um, you know, all the big picture items and then day to day, what does it look like? If you if you need a strata manager, basically at your beck and call and obviously, um, you know, let's qualify that with the kind of building it is, a very large one with on-site facilities management maybe. But if you need a strata manager at your beck and call, there's going to be a, a price that comes with that. If you just need strata management that's putting all of these sort of building-centric uh, matters in place your average property 15 lots 12 lots 20 lots six lots somewhere in the suburbs um, you probably don't need same day response on everything let's be honest if you do want that the price point's going to have to shift because we've got to create an availability for for the management team to do that and it probably again exactly to what nathan was saying depends on what kind of thing are we talking about if you're just um Putting, putting something out there about, oh, you know, how would we, um, can we set up a welcome pack for the building so we can get some more structure around move-ins? Well, that probably doesn't need to be resolved inside the next 12 hours. You know, we'll, you can start the conversation, but the resolution on that's not going to happen in, inside um, the next business day probably. And it's going to require some engagement on going with the committee. If it's more like, you know, a, a minor maintenance issue, intercom, door handle, something like that, well, then, yeah. And, and I think we really need to prioritize these are the outcomes, appropriate, proper, 
best practice strata management can deliver you. Is that what you're looking for? It should be what you're looking for. If it's not, let's at least get that conversation. Like, let's get everybody on the same page. Let's match up expectations. I think most of the time it is, but let's have that conversation at the start and emphasize again, this is your, your asset. This is probably, or for many people, it's your home. That should be where the lens that we're seeing this through, not how cheaply can I do this for? That doesn't make sense. Not with what that property means to you. That doesn't make any sense. And just generally, um, Alex, do you think most committees know what they're after? Do they understand what their needs are at that point to have that conversation with the strata manager? I'm going to venture no, and, and here's how I think they got there. Somebody um, bought into strata, joined the committee. This happened two or three more times, and you have a mix of people who've been at the building for a while and have a real passion for, for living in that community space, and then you have some some newer people. And because of the model we have where, you know, roughly it costs an owner in the vicinity of about $1.30, $1.50 a day to have a, a strata manager. Um, because of that situation, at some point in their journey and engagement with their management company, they have felt responses are slow, communication is not not there. They look at the total number of the, the, the strata, I nearly said OC there, but it could be body corporate. They look at the total number of the strata is paying on an annual basis and assume this $6,000 means any time I should be getting, you know, five hour turnaround on comms, business day turnaround on comms. Um, they're not thinking about how does that extend over 365 days divided up amongst 20 owners. So they have a bad experience. And then they go to market at the tender. All they know is they're going to get rid of this operator. It didn't work out. But, but we were paying so much. Now we have to, we've got to, we demand almost, this is the mindset I sometimes think is functioning behind the scenes. We demand to get all of our expectations and we're not, if, we're not prepared to pay more than what we were paying when those expectations weren't, weren't met. The difficulty is when they come to the next management company, it's almost like being set up to fail. Like, how do you meet that? It's very hard to do. And I think it creates almost this positive feedback cycle of a negative view of the industry, which is really unfortunate. We get it all the time when we do our, our tenders. Um, they, they come and go, oh, well, we were only paying this. Can, we, can you match what we were last paying? And uh, that, that's definitely the wrong question to be asking. It's you had the bad experience at that lower price point why would a, the same price give you the, a better outcome? Uh, and as Australian managers, I've seen other companies sit there and drop and, and match these sort of prices. And um, probably it, when I first started doing business development as well, I did the same thing, trying to, to win the business. You know, business completely agree. We've all done it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's business for the sake of business. And that's and as, a, as businesses, we've got to change that mindset by going, well, no, this is our service. This is what we offer. We've got to value what we offer to, to the client. Because uh, if we're not going to value ourselves, why should we expect the clients to value what we're offering? And we are hearing more and more stories from strata managers who are coming up against um, other companies that are just taking on the work and they seem to be winning the business for the business. Uh, the strata managers can't understand how they could be making money out of the offer that they're putting forward. So are, are companies making a decision to run buildings at a loss just to hold on to them, do you feel? Are we, you seeing that out there? We had a property almost a year ago I think around sort of April, May last year, large property, um, above 200 lots. And our um, total income per lot was in the vicinity of a bit over 400. Um, we we lost that at tender after three years and we had taken them through the state's CSV process, um, midpoint through a um, very significant building remediation works process as their their builder no longer existed and they they had a lot of cracking um in their concrete we'd only been there three years mind you one contract um we'd um helped set up a number of sort of their their governance structure with regards to committee meetings building policies that were communicated to residents we we run a um almost like a, a bm slash bm light slash caretaker tender for them um and help show them the value in bringing that into the it was like a three building site um, into that 
that space. Um, and then we lost the tender. We had a conversation about why we'd been really surprised. We had carried our price. We'd held it. So no incrementation from the previous contract. Um, and there was, um, there was three things that were said. One, we were wait, well, you know, some quotes surrounding addressing a tree were taking a bit long. There was an owner who was very unhappy at, um, at some of the defects that hadn't been fixed and was vocal about it. Um, sometimes the noisy, I mean, one owner out of 250. And then the third point was price. And we had at the last minute said, look, we can bring it back to this. If that's the difference, we can bring it back. And we'd offered to reduce by, I think, some in the vicinity of 5 or 10%. Um, we had worked out how we could maintain just being above cost on that because having a plan like that and demonstrating capability has some value as well. And they said, appreciate that, but the winning tender is half your price. Circa 200 a lot. I just said, look, so, so that's, I guess that's that. And they said, oh, but we're not leaving over the price. And I just said, look, I appreciate the time. Over a three-year contract, they were saving, you know, sort of $150,000. And, you know, what can you do? Mm. But were they really? Were they actually, was that the actual cost or had they looked into it and done a true comparison between what other charges they might be incurring over that period of time, Alex? Or you don't, don't know. know? Look, don't know you at know. that stage. Um, it just, but for, for somebody to come in and do just a couple hundred lots at 200 a lot and change, um, I don't know how that works across the board. And what, and what does it say? Um, what does it say in terms of perception about the rest of the industry? If we're already at a price point that hasn't budged in say 10, 15, maybe 20 years, what message is that sending to owners? It's you've been getting ripped off this whole time. We're the white knight. We're here to save you. Mm -hmm. And that uh, knowing, you know, a lot of people in this industry, I, I just think that's really unfortunate mm -hmm. because I don't think that's the case. I don't think anyone's getting ripped off. Do you see that too, Nathan? Are you seeing similar things? Yes, yes. Um, well, around town we, we do. There, there are some in the market that do want to go quite low in their fees. Um and, and you do you know, wonder how that how they are making a profit in that. Uh, you do see the swings on the back end, so they're obviously trying to get build the market share in a certain segment as well. Uh, so if it is the or, or the larger schemes, I know Newcastle's <laughs> larger schemes version to, compared to Melbourne's probably totally different. <laughs> um, but in, if you're trying to buy in that market, I'll get into that market. There are players here that are what you would term buying the market. Um, but again, then they rotate through. You, you'd seen they hold the contract three, maybe four years. Your first contracts are usually now 12 months because they've been burned previously. Put all your resources in that first year, get them for three years, and then you almost forget about them. And that's that's been the system on, on many plans around. You just see them come to market every three or four years. So, um, you know, and there's other players sit there and they, they beg for the extra year. They don't get the extra year. I'm not sure there's some sort of sweeteners they get. You see they're putting all your work for. Um, tendering on those businesses and then they go oh, well we'll be, we've been promised one more year is going to be better um, <laughs> so they get four or five years out of them rather than the than the, the three but again if you alex is spot on you've got to be able to, to manage your, your market you manage your your price points where if you're not making money you're not going to be able to service them uh they're all going to get a bad taste and then that's going to reflect on the staff not only the, the you know uh in the industry where you say, oh, you've worked for those, that sort of person, that's, you know, their quality that we're hearing is not real good, or it's they're just going to get phone call after phone call that's not very nice, which is going to really affect their mental health and, again, increase the the turnout and the turnover and the, the burnout of the staff. It's just it's, it's not good all around for any any of the stakeholders. With reference to the benchmark report, if you were to grab a layperson and say, I've got this industry for you, it manages... $1.3 trillion worth of property. And you're thinking, okay, great. So it's probably a little bit recession proof to a degree. And I think that's a fair statement. Uh, the average profit margin has been on a downward trend for 17 years. You'd say, okay, all right. I'm still listening, but now I'm sort of, all right. You'd say staff key or key relationship, you know, staff turnover, that's 33% a year. Right. All right. Um, Revenue per lot has gone up a little bit, but much slower than business growth in so far as profits are concerned. 
It's like, all right. And there's no barrier to entry to operate in this space. Are you interested? And the person's going to be like, it's not this Nigerian print scam, is it? The reason I say that, and that's a really harsh way to frame it, but the reason I say that is we have, I think undeniably, a fantastic, absolutely amazing, you know, cadre of people within the industry. Um, but the model is not sustainable. One of the arguments I've heard from from a number of people is it's all about how you sell yourself. Well, maybe it is sometimes. And that comes down to winning the business against, you know, people doing the same thing. But at the end of the day, the price point has not changed. Salaries have gone up as they should have. Nobody's asking staff to work for free. I don't think Nathan or I have, would be would be keen with that proposition either. No, um, <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> but put all these things together, and what are we? Um, what are we faced with? And I think inflection point, they nailed it. Something has to give. We have to make a change in terms of sustainable strata, sustainable pricing. Um, we don't want the people who understand how to do this and how to do it well, who have strata knowledge, who have relationships with insurance companies, insurance brokers, every contractor, you know, under the sun, um, the EV industry, you know, for, for example, we have those relationships in place across the board, across that spectrum. We don't want the people to leave on account of workload uh, being too high or remuneration being insufficient because there are many industries where these skills transfer over to very well. Uh, and sometimes, you know, when you're speaking with a, a, an old comrade who's left the industry and you hear about the reduction in, in the after hours load the, 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 the better um, work-life balance for the same same wage, same salary. You're like, oh, that's, you're almost, like I'm almost starting to get tempted here. I better, I better fake that I've got a phone call and have to go or else I'm <laughs> going to go past the point of no return. We don't want that to happen. Everyone, just about everyone I've ever worked with, you know, the, the current team I have in branch, they're amazing. I don't want them going anywhere for these factors. I want us to have discipline in charging what we're worth and, getting to a uh, a more realistic proposition across the board. So on that point, let's talk about the power of the employee. So if strata managers are unhappy, are they exercising their power by moving to companies with more sustainable business models? And if so, what effect will this have on the industry in the long term, do you think? The grass always green, and that's always the question you ask. And you know, when you speak to them, okay, sometimes it's, it's yes, sometimes it's no, they're just Jumping from you know, one pot into another pot, um, but the change is you know they you know, the first twelve months always of, of a change of, of employment they always feel good yep loving it loving it but then you know they fall back into the same old habits and I think it is because you know the companies then have to pay for that staff member so they 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 see numbers we've got this new employee now we've hardly had a strata manager so now we've got to give them work so they're out to the market even if they've got lower the cost to get. A portfolio for these guys to manage um and then that's when they get to a point go okay well we can't afford you until we give you it could be 70 buildings it could be 100 buildings because the price point we've, we've gone in on it, it's just not sustainable so they get back in the same old routine of having to work after hours to do a, what should be done in your 40 hour week that's not including your after hours meetings that you got to do that sort of thing but it's, you know trying to get agendas done trying to you know, manage the, the email workload that's just exponentially increasing <laughs> week on week at the moment. It's just, um, it, it, it's, and the workloads change too from when I started 18 years ago to now. Uh, emails. You were getting simply, letters, right? You were still getting letters. Yeah, well, yeah, we're getting a lot of letters. Like email was just starting to, to come into vogue, but the volume of emails, the expectation of the return, as you mentioned earlier, the return the same day email. Um, and communication on on things that really don't need your attention that day it could could even be you know two or three days before you know it, it realistically needs an answer, but you still then got to prioritize because the next day you're going to get an email or you get an email and then you get a phone call an hour later. Did you get my, my email? You haven't responded yet, and it, that's sort of trying to set that expectation with with the clients that just burns people out. We see that a bit. Um, 
and I don't want to say um, it's pressure. It's more like, you know, there's there's something from an employee who has done a really good job and you want to make sure that you can create the right long-term um, place for them. The culture is probably about right. They have great internal relationships. And at this point, they've put in two or three years stable portfolio. They've got the, the external relationships too. They're not keen to go and find um, find a new place and have to restart that process again. Because if you had, whether it's 40 properties, maybe it's a high-rise portfolio of eight properties, but they're all really key, you know? Um, or maybe it's 80 properties and they're all small or smaller and you, you've you already, your AGM schedule is in concrete every year. And at, at this point, you know, you can do it with, with one hand, um, on the keyboard, one eye on the screen and the other one on the footy almost. It's that you you know you know what you're doing that well. But you don't want to walk away from that. However, you do want to get paid more and at some point you're going to want development opportunities. Um, the business has to be able to accommodate those. We, whether it's on print media, social media, general conversation, that's that's a that's something we talk about all the time. Right? Um, and if they're not there, people will look. And that's fair enough. That's fair enough. You know, Nathan and I have obviously moved for opportunities at different time that weren't just about, you know, geography or whatever. We've we've sought out something. Everybody's done that. Um, but we don't want it to be because we can't afford you. Which is it can you know, it's it's fair to say a lot of I think strata management employers and operators can genuinely say we really value you, but we can't afford the money you're talking about. And we're happy to explain why. To say to do that we would have to bring in this much more money and you would need to be responsible for it, which is going to increase your workload. Which, and all of a sudden, you're not going to want to be here anymore. And I think that's a pretty tragic reason to lose someone. They're excellent. They get great feedback. But because of the money coming in for the work they're doing and for the work all of their colleagues are doing being just not enough 15, 20 years later, um, you know, we're faced with having to ask them to be patient and trust us. And maybe they've been approached by a recruiter or by a friend at another company, or they've just gone on seek and they've seen a remuneration point, which is a game changer for them. Mm -hmm. What do we do? So maybe it does come down to business models a little bit. Um, I, there's an increasing number of players who use offshoring. Um, is that what we want? Uh, maybe there are some aspects of the role that can be readily commoditized, but you can set it up in an offshore model. Uh, I I tend to feel like maybe AI is going to pick up some of that in the future. But then I also think if our customers know that we're either doing offshoring or AI, are they going to come back and say, well, why am I paying the same? It used to be I was paying for a manager and an assistant manager and this support and that support and that support. And now you're just telling me it's the first two and everything is now AI. So shouldn't that, you've reduced costs. Shouldn't you reduce your price? So I think that's a potentially treacherous road that we're all going to have to explore. Um, and I just, I've thought about it every which way. If we, if we don't increase the price point, we're not going to be able to keep people who deliver for us as an industry, not as a, you know, not as individual companies. I just think, considering how easy it is to get into this industry and present yourself, at least in Victoria, all you have to do is register your business and not be a criminal. That's pretty easy for most of us. Um, at least, you know, New South Wales has licensing. Um, I just think we have to start talking as an industry about where the price point should be. Having the discipline not to grow at any cost. If you want to grow the business outright, you're probably better off looking into acquisition of other businesses because you know rather than competing in that race to the bottom i don't think you can race to the bottom into profitability either and definitely not into sustainability so what suggestions do you have when you speak about it being an industry-wide decision uh, are you talking about minimum fees per lot or price fixing to ensure sustainability pricing and service delivery alex i, I really do think there is something to be done about an RRP statement by the SCA. Um, 
and that's probably the state bodies. Nationally, there's a lot of variants. And we've got to remember as well, within each state, there's different types of strata. You know, Queensland has got its modules. Uh, Victoria's introduced the tiered system. Um, and if we just to talk about what the properties look like, well, you've got basically large scale with on-site building management services. You've got townhouses where the common property is largely the road and maybe some footpath, stuff like that, some street lighting, but that's it. You've got commercial, industrial. You've got very small schemes, say for apartments. And then you've got everything else, which is an apartment block from four to six lots up to maybe 100, 120, with, you know, wherever building management starts. Um, and I think probably we need some sort of recommended pricing stamp from the SCA in each state saying this is what it costs at least. Um, and if you're not paying this, buy beware. You should expect poor service. You should expect staff turnover, things like that. I don't know. I mean, you don't want to handicap yourself in saying this is the minimum price and therefore everybody says, I'm happy just to pay the minimum. I don't want any more. But there needs to be some action taken so that, you know, alignment, with, I think alignment with the, the representative body means um, alignment with sustainable pricing. You know, that's my my personal view, just as I've I've been thinking, how do you do this? And I can't see it. We've had so long to do it through goodwill, you know, and it hasn't happened. And with new players coming into the market all the time, which is completely fine. It's a thriving industry. I don't know that that's, you know, how do, how do you, how do you break into a new market? You offer a better price point. I think it's got to start with our state bodies. Um, SCA I, I, in New South Wales we're a little bit different. Like we, we've got the professional standards and that sort of thing. Now I think as a state body and as an, as an industry, especially in New South Wales, we need to be uh, pushing that professionalism a little bit more and putting a bit of value on that. I think yeah, we, we're going, we're a professional body now, and we just put a logo on your on your email, and and that's the extent of the, the public perception of it. Anyway, I think uh, if we work better uh, as an industry and uh, as an industry and as a state body on uh, promoting that more as a professional strata manager, this is what you should expect on service levels and standards, that sort of thing. And this is an average price point of, of it. Um, the thing could come out. And if, if, if you were more than that, this is what we offer better. This is our, our point of difference compared to Joe Blow down the road. So if we've got to start talking on points of difference and what services we're doing better than someone else rather than, as uh, you said, coming to a market and trying to come in with at the cheapest price, just come in and do it better. Yeah, I agree. I also think one of the things we, we uh, the story that's probably not um, discussed very well, which is very well, very often, it's not obvious necessarily. If somebody comes into the market, maybe they acquire a small portfolio, 500,000 lots from somebody else. Uh, it's a profitable venture because their overheads are like this, right? They've got two maybe three salaries, uh, possibly a very small office. So they, and, and they're pitching themselves through relationships originally to make sure they've got that, that base of clients and also, um, also the bespoke service. And then they grow and all of a sudden they're 3,000 or 5,000 lots. The price point they were able to offer at 1,000 probably isn't the same price point they're able to offer at five or 10 to make the same margin and to pay now experienced staff, more of them, more overheads, and to have an insurance person, an accountant. It's not just you anymore. You, you know, you're, it's not 500 lots anymore. You actually need an accountant to handle all of this. It's, you know, um, maybe there's an assistant manager of some description or a, just a, a general, you know, sort of floating support role behind the scenes, um, that sort of thing. The closer you get to 10,000 lots, you're going to need an operations manager uh, or you're going to be that operations manager and you're going to need a business development manager. All of a sudden, three years later, because maybe you acquired another small company along the way, all of a sudden, that price point from when you set out that was really profitable, no longer viable because you have all these extra costs, but you don't want to change your price because it successfully brings in new business. And so the only way you can manage that is to load up the staff more, which again, is it's just not sustainable.
at some point those staff are going to leave. You're going to go out and replace them. Uh, they're going to have enthusiasm. They're going to have drive. A year, year and a half in, they're going to realize this is not sustain. It's not viable for me long term, and they're going to move to another company which either presents more money for the same amount of work or less work for the same amount of money. And so the cycle continues. And what's coming out of all of this is impact to the clients, impact to the buildings. And then they all see, like I talked about before, strata a certain way, which is an uphill battle. We now have to sell. You should pay more to get the service you wanted and you weren't getting before. And they're like, well, what have I been paying for all this time? Probably some tighter regulation and something from, from the SCA that is updated, that is paid attention to, um, that maybe is enforceable. If you're using an SCA contract, it's got to, or an SCA approved contract, it's got to have this on it. And if not, maybe you're not in the SCA and you don't get to claim that professional integrity. That's, I, I don't see any other pathway myself um, than through the industry body because we can't have a group of five or six operators colluding. That's not ethical. It's not lawful. Uh, I don't even know if it would be effective, to be honest with you. There's, there's too many players. We need an industry-wide approach. I, th I think we've got a right and probably even a responsibility to to have a conversation about pricing as an industry with the customer. So how can body corporate companies improve transparency and clarity in management contracts to address concerns about hitting, hidden costs and encourage owners to support them in return for better service? Are strata companies prepared to have an honest conversation with owners about what their real costs are to encourage owners to support them in return? When you're doing your, your, your marketing processes and when you're going through your tender process, you've you got to be open and transparent on what, you, what services you're offering. So I think... Clarity, maybe a one page or something comes out and go, this is what you're going to get for your base fee. Um, and then be transparent again, go, we'll give you a couple of examples of what would be an additional charge. Um, because I think, I know I've heard a lot of comments around, well, why don't we just charge a, a, a larger base fee, not worry about what we term our schedule B, additional services fees? Uh, with every property, it's totally different. Like, we, we we have to price in what our tangible, what we know is going to happen. So we can do that by, we know, we know we're going to send an agenda out. We know we're going to send your four levies. We know we're going to do minutes. We know we, you know, there's going to be a certain amount of communication come through. But there's always that outlier where, you know, there's, there's a massive uh, amount of, of of maintenance that needs to be done over a, a short period of time or communication levels and expectation levels are just, you know, off their rocker. And so you do have to charge an additional service to, to be able to to fund your business because obviously you need staff to, to manage that workload. Yeah, it, it was it was as simple as this is what we do. We'll just charge that. Um, go to a different supplier for additional services. We would be able to give them a, a base salary, a, a base wage, and go. This is all you're going to pay. But with so many variables within the industry, within the within the, the scheme, so you could have one five lot scheme that's totally different to another five lot scheme or twenty lot scheme. They're totally different sort of workloads depending on the personalities, how easy the community are to deal with. Um, are the committee active? You know, it, owners really have to take a little bit of responsibility themselves on, on on the work that they do, especially in these schemes, you know, 15, 20, 30 lot schemes where you have a lot of committees that sit there and go, we pay you to do it, you just do it, rather than taking that approach, which would save them a lot of money on management fees. You, you, you've got to have a, an open conversation about saying, this is what we're doing for the fee. This is everything that could happen. You know, three, I think it was three, maybe four years ago, during one of our lockdowns, you'll lose track of what happens in lockdown in Victoria. But during one of those, we had like the six point something earthquake. You know, I don't think anybody's really envisaged having to deal with the, the insurance questions and the maintenance questions that come out of an earthquake in Strata and Victoria. So if you had an all-inclusive fee on all of your buildings and all of a sudden that happens... And even if like no buildings fell down or anything, but there's maintenance, there's cracking, everybody everybody in the world wrote saying, can you just check the insurance policy for us and make sure we're covered for earthquake? Like, you know, and by the way, we'd, we'd really like to find out in the next day so we can get to first first of the queue, first in the queue in case there is anything. Um, you know, that's, that's a lot of work. How are you going to factor that into a, an all-in fee? Is that this contract is to keep your owner's corporation compliant to protect it? Um, minimize its liabilities, make sure that you are reporting as required. So your AGM, tax, uh, maintain insurance, all of that. 
but in terms of the stuff that requires real work, that's going to be charged for if and when. And you can have that conversation with the owners, but then perhaps like anybody, the immediate the immediate mindset is, oh, I'm just going to get charged for everything. You know, there'll be hidden charges, run for the hills, which then, again, how do you balance that out? If we're going to look at a, a closer to an inclusive um more inclusive management fee it's got to be a higher number it can't just be okay we'll add 20 bucks a lot that'll cover it you know that's six minutes a year per lot based on an hourly rate so i think we probably don't do a good enough job at least in victoria of talking about additional services what the contract is for what the costs are and when those charges apply you're paying us to do the the meetings and the compliance, the financials, the record keeping, answer general queries, and arrange minor maintenance. That's what that's what the the retainer management fee is. Place your insurance. That's what the retainer fee is. When stuff happens, nobody knows when that is. This is these are the costs. Um, that's the stuff that you would be handling in a in a standalone property. Now, you can always do that yourself, of course, if you don't want to use your manager as your middleman, but we are here for that. And there's a, you know, there's a reasonable cost for that. Uh, and that's sometimes the conversation I've had. The bigger the property, usually the happier they are for you to handle it. Everyone wants to know what, what's their fee going to be uh, at the end of the day. And, and and the only way you can explain it is, you know, if, you, um, you know, if you're only going to you the base services, that's what your fee is going to be. But if you're going to, you know, you're going to do a roof replacement, yeah, I, I can average, I can estimate it's going to cost me, you know, three hours of my time to go out with it, you know, get scopes of work, um, pass them to the committee, discuss this with the committee, go get re-scoped when there's you know, issues with some scopes, then come back to you, come back to a meeting and, and do it. So you can estimate per some things, but, you know, have certainty, you're never going to have that in the Australian industry unless you went to a fixed fee, which is then, as we've already spoken about, one scheme is going to subsidise another or it's, it's just blatantly not fair for, for some schemes. I've sometimes said, I've said, well, what happens if there's a fire? Like, if there's a fire that affects, you know, there's going to be extra costs there. You don't want us on site for that one, even if just to calm people. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that sort of thing's okay. And we've established in principle you're prepared to pay additional service fees. Let's find out what the scope of that is. Like, let's go to an extreme. You know, what if we have to go to VCAT for three days? Not the lawyer, as in we have to. You can understand why there'd be a cost for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's unlikely to happen. Whatever it is, let's get agreement on the concept and then let's work back. Now, the more inclusions you want, the higher the base fee is going to be. Um, and what we try and do is come back to you know Nathan's point about point of difference is say we're giving you the manager the you know the assistant manager we've got relief coverage so you, you your portfolio you know the property is we've got dedicated coverage when the staff member takes their holidays whatever and whatever the business has to offer varies but it'll be some combination of insurance compliance um, you know a frontline team of some description. Um, all of that sort of thing. And then there'll be service level agreements about how quickly we do and don't do things, right? And that varies business to business. And then, it, you know, the manager we're giving you, look at their profile. They've been with us this long and this is their experience. And But I think it all starts with you accept in principle, this could happen, right? There is no certainty. This could happen. Something building related, uh, you know, a flood of one of the levels through a burst pipe, whatever it is. And then, work backwards until you can find out at least where they're prepared to give ground and then say, well, if you want all of that thrown in, you know, it's going to be this point. Sometimes you're successful, sometimes you're not. But that probably also speaks to um, the, uh, the the manager Nathan referenced earlier. It's about you want to select your clients too. Mm. You know, if, you, if, if you could make a certain amount of, a certain amount of money profit, business profit, off 10,000 clients or the same total number of 20,000 clients. It's the first one's a lot more appealing. I would have thought. 
Uh, Do you think strata management firms are looking at it that way? Are they going into that much detail? Can they tell which buildings are profitable and which buildings aren't profitable, the majority of them out there? Um, I, I would think that uh, a good business should look at that uh, routinely through their business. Uh, we're, we're, we are personally going through that again now within our business. Um, it, it's something you know we look at probably every every couple of years um, to see where things are sitting. You know, especially when we're looking at when we're going to go out to tender, or when we're going to renew schemes. Um, are they profitable? You know, what's the, what's the workload like for these schemes? Uh, and is our management agreement in line with with the services that we're providing? You know, is yeah, are we including too much, or are we not including enough, and we're actually yeah you know, more profitable than we thought, <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> not not the, the it's not, not common, but there are schemes in here that, that we're managing and we go, okay, well, we could probably drop it a little bit next year because we are. Um, they're, they're a good scheme, good good committees, properties in good order, they're raising plenty of money. Yeah, they're, they're the easy ones. So, yeah, you wouldn't want to charge them at the, the higher level. But it's, it's those ones that, you know, always, they always want a penny pinch and, and don't have the money. So every time you want to, there is some maintenance speed work need to be done. It's almost a, a, a fight to say, you know, the access you must get this done, and and then having to go to you know, you know to special meetings just to get things approved it, and and money raised. It's you know, day to day, you just don't have the time for that in your business. It's like, well, are they worth re are they worth keeping? You know, that, that's the question we ask. There's um there's definitely an element of that within the industry. I think it's probably greater the larger an organization like you moving into that middle and larger organization size um I, mainly because your costs are so low when you're a smaller operator right P particularly around the infrastructure and and that's people and property you just don't have those if your business is six people your overheads are so little confirmed to if your business is 30 or interstate that sort of thing so um yeah i i can't speak for um for all of them but the ones i've been associated with definitely made that judgment um you know one of the, the my previous employers at a large property um they went to tender and um that uh the you know the um powers that be didn't go in at a lower point or held the same they actually said we've reviewed our pricing we haven't changed it in six years here's here's where it needs to be um, and they let that plan walk because it wasn't a profitable enterprise. And hats off, you never want it. You never want it to be just about a price. But if if that's for whatever reason, change in circumstances of the property or change in committee membership, if that's what it's come down to, you know, um, maybe it's better to let them walk. They could come back. They could come back. And I mean, ultimately, it's good for the committee for the company to be making a profit out of it because it means they're being serviced well. The, the I mean, surely they want the strata manager to be paid well so that the strata manager is paying attention to that committee and they're there for them too and they're not walking and, to and another company. Away, so, yeah. yeah, I think there's a case for the committee to understand that it's a good thing for the company to be stable and you, know, you don't want the company not to be stable. You want the company that you're working for to be working well and and looking after their staff in a way that they can. And it's also coming back to something I said earlier, we're talking about your home, right? You're an owner if you're if you're an owner. We're talking about your home or your investment. Majority, I think, these days are probably still owners. I don't think, um, I wouldn't think it's anything like half the apartments out there are investments, um, not when you think about suburban apartments. Majority are homes. Don't... You, if something happens to that, what happens to you? If you all of a sudden have to raise a special levy across 10 or 12 owners for 300000 maybe for underpinning works or something like that, or um, a lift replacement that's 10 years too early because the maintenance fund wasn't set up properly, and where's that coming from? No, that's 30, 30 grand immediately um, across those 10 owners each, and Want to throw cost of living as a hashtag into the mix? Thirty grand's a pretty big hit to the cost of living. Um, it's probably going back on your mortgage, and then your mortgage repayments are going to change by some amount. And I just think, you know, as I've and I've been parroting this a lot lately, but currently, 
paying a manager somewhere between a buck thirty and a buck fifty a day. Make that two dollars, and all of a sudden, staff can keep. Uh, sorry, companies can keep their staff by appropriately remunerating them, by providing a better service, spreading the workload, training and development. Um, you know, sending them to look up Strata webinars, things like that. Um, and for what a fifty cent coin a day, that's the difference. Okay, in a percentage, it's high. Yeah, it's a a thirty percent increase. In terms of real dollars and cents, it's not that much, and it makes across a a reasonable size business doesn't have to be national, but across what we might call by SCA award standards a mid sized business, fifty cents a day makes the world of difference. Hundred and fifty bucks a year for your six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar apartment. It's, I mean, to me, it's a no brainer. When you're looking at uh, investment funds, you know, you're paying investment fund manager of you know a million dollar investment fund manager two or three percent of your fund um, balance to manage your fund of a million dollars. Now we're, we're sitting here and we're talking about uh, managing. The Strata scheme to could be ten million dollars, but they they they're complaining about point one of a percent of a management fee, uh, and and I say it's, it's quite an important role when you go look at the compliance, you're looking at the maintenance and keeping the value of the scheme, because uh, a lot can happen with a poor manager. You have a poor manager, the maintenance slips, your your fees, your management um, budgets aren't there. The fund, the ongoing maintenance, it falls into disrepair, and then what could be a, a $10 million asset becomes a massive liability of, of of special levies to try and bring it back up to the standard. What we have to do better is communicate to the client. The difference isn't between paying $400 a lot across all, you know, total revenue, $400 a lot to $800 or $700 a lot. Realistically, I think it should be more like 1000 but let's say $700 or $800 a lot. That's not the difference. The difference is what happens to that $700,000 house or apartment if it's not maintained. Try selling that with special levies on the the um, the OC certificate, you know, the disclosure statement. Try selling that with special levies um, with your expert reports showing cracking or showing a lift replacement to be done in four years and, you know, $500,000 levy to be raised, those sorts of things. Try selling that one day. So do you see the future as being uh, just large, really large businesses or strata management companies, or can you see there's a place for these smaller boutique businesses or medium-sized businesses? What's going to happen in the future, do you think? Uh, personally, I think I think there's a place for everyone in the industry. I think with, with the, the growth and continued growth in in strata buildings, you know, we are moving, we are well, well and truly there on the medium and high density living, and it's just only going to get more and more. So, I think everyone's got a place, everyone will have their niche. If we offered the service levels that I think every strata manager wants to offer, uh, but maybe doesn't have the time or the or the support structures in place to do that, uh, I think it's going to make it a lot harder for those um, low, lower fee businesses to either stay afloat or. or or use as a marketing plan uh, because people realise that this isn't the service level we need, so let's pay more. And I think as an industry, if, if we can show that, uh, I think that there's still a place for you know the, the, the one main band, the medium schemes. But in essence, I still do think that the bigger players are going to look at them as as a profitable income stream as well and want to take them on as well. I um I don't ever think we want to be in a Coles or Worth Aldi situation. And I don't think we're going to head that way. Uh, there's too much strata, too much. And I do think a lower price point makes sense for a number of different types of plans. Small ones, townhouses, corporate factory blocks, you know, or corporate office blocks. They're always going to be cheaper than apartment blocks. Like the needs are less. Um, and um, larger operators um, who are more focused on that core product probably lose out in the long run competing for that sort of business because the the number of opportunities to display your expertise is reduced, for instance. Um, you know, and that's just one reason. And it, like I said before, there's no barrier to entry, right? Anyone can do it. There's going to be so much strata that smaller players are always going to be there. And I think they're an important competitive element. The issue right now 
is that it's detrimental to successful strata management. And it's that cycle of starting small, becoming bigger, not evolving your price point, and then the workload um, staff turnover problem becomes becomes a real factor. And now all of a sudden that middle-sized business has the same challenges that all of its previous competitors had. The industry, I, I don't think it'll change that much because the rate of the rate of um, client available the rate of the client available coming onto the market is just too great. I thank you very much for your time. I know how busy you both are. So thank you for that. But uh, yeah, any last words before we wrap it up? A few very basic stats. Our, our industry turnover rate of qualified staff is too high. Our profitability point, our profitability tra tra trajectory is doing that and we need to fix it. You can't reduce costs to nothing. And if you reduce them as low as you can, what then? We've seen that fees and remuneration from the client don't index. They haven't really indexed, you know. Like I still see contracts being put up for renewal today that are the same same numbers I saw when I joined the industry. Maybe it's true for you too, Nathan, in some instances. And I'm talking total revenue, not just how it's split. And I think um, if we look at the increase in remuneration in recent years because the total has gone up, I think a large part of that surrounds the insurance and where that's gone. Um, the rate that we charge per lot or our hourly rate, definitely not. And we've got to fix that. We all love what we do. You know, this is just something that needs to happen to, to keep it being viable. If you gained value from this video, please hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're looking for information about parking, strata insurance, defects and more, head over to lookupstrata.com.au or sign up to our free weekly newsletter via the link in the description box below.